Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're taking a look at this original U.S. Lindsay two-shot 1863 double percussion rifle. Approximately 1,000 of these two-shot 58 caliber muskets were manufactured by J.P. Lindsay of New York between 1863 and 1864. They are known to have been tested by or issued to the 5th, 16th, and 23rd Michigan and 9th New Hampshire. Lindsay patent October 9th, 1860 is marked on top of the breech. Two oval script ADK representing Andrew D. King. Inspection cartouches are stamped on the left stock flat. The Lindsay muskets were designed to shoot a superposed muzzle-loading charge, meaning that it was capable of shooting two shots instead of one before it needing reloading. Presumably, Lindsay thought that federal contractors and purchasing agents would see an advantage to having two shots in a musket instead of the typical one. Interestingly, both hammers were intended to be engaged by a single trigger, with the right hammer being the first to fall. This particular design has received widespread contemporary acknowledgement of one of the worst firearms inventions of the American Civil War era. For size and weight, the two-shot Lindsay was very close in weight to the federal issue single-shot muskets produced by many contractors of the time. As the story goes, J.P. Lindsay, the inventor of this musket and similar handguns, had experienced tragedy when his brother was killed and scalped. While Lindsay's brother was able to kill one of his two attackers with his single-shot musket, the second attacker was able to overcome the now defenseless man. It is said that Lindsay always felt that a two-shot firearm might have made a difference in his brother's final fight. Soldiers of the 16th Michigan Volunteers in Combat at Peebles Farm, Virginia in 1864 reported that in the heat of battle, simultaneous discharge of both charges was a common event and the stress of firing a double charge often destroyed the gun. In firearms development and manufacturing, the American Civil War led to and really ignited a lot of innovation that would go on to define American arms manufacturing for the next 50 to 100 years, really. The Lindsay, however, did not really take part in that. Uh, being a small batch of manufacture with a design that had good intentions, it would soon be leapfrogged really by cartridge and repeating arms before the concept could be refined and made really practical. We see a lot of superposed loaded muzzle loaders over the years dating back to the wheel lock era, but none of them really caught on even up to and through the percussion era. At first observation, this Lindsay operates on a very similar platform to the common federal contract rifles for the American Civil War era. I believe on first glance, if you didn't notice the absence of the side lock plate here, you could think at first glance that this is just your typical American Civil War federal contract musket. Going back here to our butt plate, we have a pretty standard iron butt plate with our two butt plate screws. At the rear, we have a US stamp on the tang of our butt plate. And then we have some small marks here just behind that screw. The stock itself is of the profile of the common Springfield muskets of the day. We have a rather short length of pull, a defined but subtle crest here, a round toe, and a slight drop between the line coming back from our barrel down to the heel of our butt plate. Moving forward through the wrist, it is unadorned. Our trigger guard on the bottom, again, isn't too far away from the trigger guards that we see on other federal contract muskets of its day. At the front, we have a screw securing the trigger guard to the stock, and we have another one at the rear. We have a single bow on our trigger guard covering our single trigger inside, and we have a sling swivel here at the front bow of our trigger guard. Our barrel tang bolt comes through the stock and intersects with the rear of our trigger guard just forward of the second or rear trigger guard screw. The lock on this piece is completely internal and in line with the barrel. 
On the right here, we have our primary hammer, and on the left, we have our secondary hammer. They are identical in design. And at the rear here, we have a nice even split as these hammers separate from each other to go to their respective nipples or cones. Placing this on half cock reveals the standard musket size nipple for the day, and to the left we have the secondary nipple. Forward of that we have the breech assembly here stamped with Lindsay and the patent date of October 9th, 1860. We have an octagonal facet on this breech section before we step down into our rounded barrel with some facets. About an inch and a half forward of our breech area here, we have flip up rear sight. We have our first notch, presumably for 50 or 100 yards. Our second pops up to 300 yards, and the third is indicated for 500 yards, although we can only speculate on how much use this particular kind of musket saw at those distances. Forward from here, we have a pretty standard American Civil War musket pattern, at least for the Union side here. We have three barrel bands that work to contain the barrel, stock, and ramrod. On the underside, like many federal contract muskets for the period, our ramrod channel all but totally encapsulates our ramrod, allowing it to be securely fastened to the underside of the stock. Our middle barrel band also doubles as a catch for our forwardmost sling swivel. At the muzzle end, we have an iron nose cap between our ramrod and barrel. Between our hammers and the nipples or cones here, we have two screws set up here. For my own curiosity, I've placed both hammers at full cock here, and I'm going to gently release our trigger while holding the hammers so that I can keep uh, them from smashing into the nipples here. We'll see if our right hammer is the one that drops first. And it is. And then, simply with a second pull of the trigger, <laughs> our left hammer falls. I love these stunted, we'll say, branches of arms manufacturing and muzzle-loading history. It's very obvious, especially with the way Lindsay's story goes, at least here, that the intentions were good for this design. It just wasn't as practical as it could have been, and like I said, would be overrun by smokeless and cartridge arms rather quickly after its invention. I hope that you've enjoyed going along on this brief tour of one of 1,000 produced Lindsay superposed percussion muskets here today. I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for giving me the opportunity to share this piece with you today. If you'd like to learn more about this and many other antique arms, I encourage you to visit the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages to learn more. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.